CCR's Nickerson State Park in Brewster on Saturday, August 17th. Against the Tide offers participants chip time, swim, run, and aquathon components. Thank you for tuning in again. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about the sound, how we hear sound in reality. Last week, I mentioned a little bit about the similarity between the B and M. I understand that you can never, you know, uh, get it, you know, if you read from books, how come a B is an M? But I'm going to show you some clips, you know, where I took, you know, when I was living with some shepherds, you know, and when they separate, the little uh, lamb from the sheep. I want you to hear the sound and tell me what you hear, okay? And the second point I want to make tonight is uh, to make you understand how uh, understanding itself needs the cooperation of all our senses. Sometimes what the book transcribed to you might not be uh, what you think it is. So uh, I'm going to start now and yes. Just one sec. And um, if I'm going too fast, you can actually go ahead and uh, type in the, my, the program name Basket Starfish, our language core in YouTube. I have 46 episodes already up there. So you can rewatch it again so you can understand my points better, okay? First of all, I'm going to uh, repeat the same thing to let you see what a basket starfish is like. So uh, what I, my point is, is um, this is the common core that we share. Every single uh, family is just a branch. We are not a separate family tree. And because if we believe in that, we will also usher in human hierarchy. And for the last uh, more than 20 years, I've been traveling around just to search, you know, the common core of our, our human language. I think, you know, the uh, understanding it as a different family tree, uh, it needs to be changed because it is a very patriarchal, you know, view that they are presenting to you. Instead, I'm presenting to you from an Asian female perspective and also as a traveler. I don't understand uh, language in a classroom setting. I travel around and understand it uh, in real life okay so um, I will go on to let you hear the sound in nature sometimes uh, our sound is actually impossible to put down you can only hear it and um, today I'm going to give you an example how the B and the M can be very very similar okay and um, uh, that's how you know you come to this idea the babe and the ma so I will let you see it and please uh, watch it on your own and um, this is a, a clip that I took in a very remote island in the middle of the Indian Ocean called Socotra and um, you will see that uh, the baby lamb are being locked up in a stone hut and then all this mother lamb were standing up on a hill they are calling each other in a very interesting way. I, I was there listening for it for more than 10, two hours before I started, you know, shooting this video. And because this is a place where there is no electricity, so I had to be very fugal with my battery in the camera. So I just took very, very short clips, you know, hopefully that you, you can hear the sound as I did, okay? These are the mother sheep. So look at this now. I want you to hear it more. These are the baby sound. Those outside in unison were the mother group calling the baby sheep. These are the mother.
Okay. Okay, I will stop it for one second. Okay, I will stop it for one second. Uh, I want you to analyze what you just heard. I hope the machine transcribed the sound to you as I heard it in nature. Uh, you can hear it very distinctively. The baby is really calling mad as if uh, they are speaking French. And then the mothership is actually calling babe. And it is very interesting. And also in this island, I heard a very interesting consonant. Uh, none of the linguists who arrived in the island can figure out how to write it out because it is a sound like this. You have to look at how I pronounce it, okay? It's he, 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 he. Uh, if I have to write it down, it either will be a she or a he, okay? So um, this is a very interesting point to let you know that sound is very difficult to write down. Whatever we our choice is, we actually sacrifice the other one. The only way we can understand sound is in situ, to hear it ourselves. So um, if a linguist choose to write down SH as the consonant, and then uh, he or she will miss the H sound. And if he or she, if he write down H, then the SH sound will be lost for Forever. And also interesting enough, this sound is actually made by the sheep itself, you know, and, and I saw the sheep making this sound uh, precisely. So human being in a way might be really learning sound from the animal itself. And this is part of the human development, nothing to be ashamed of. Okay, so uh, I'm going down to my next point is that uh, the next point will be, we have to use all our senses to the cooperation of our senses to understand what uh, is transcribed, okay? So by pure reading a book alone, we always understand things wrongly or only part of the truth, okay? So I will go on to uh, this slide, okay? Okay, uh, so it all calls for, uh, for the flexibility to understand things. We use our eye, our mind and ears to understand. You know, this is the most simple three things that we use to understand. So sometimes, you know, we have to translate something visually. So when I say it's a, a river, I can describe it as a snake, right? So the snake also easily transcribed to a rope itself. So because of the curling forms, so the mental concept is also interchanged with each other. There is no direct boundary between all these uh, ways of understanding things. And the other thing we have to pay attention is also the sound shifting. So if we pay so much attention, you know, we think that if we write down B is definitely B, then we are becoming very close-minded in understanding true human language, okay? So I will go on. And uh, the following slides, I will use uh, the first human technology, as I say again and again, the trailing of thread and the weave you know as example to express my point okay to explain my points okay you will understand the trailing and the weaving why the W is so important okay and these are the pictures I took uh, on my journeys you know this is uh, the Bedouin people who are uh, trailing their threads and these are some barber uh, tribes that uh, I found in Tunisia in the desert so you will see that constantly they are still doing that nowadays in the modern society we are far away from this basic necessity in human life so uh, it uh, it's um, no wonder that we don't tend to understand things as it used to be okay so I will show you some ancient uh, forms of writing so you will understand how intermingle uh, understanding is okay so this is an ancient Egyptian, hiero uh, Egyptian hieroglyph and this is a W okay it's like a whirling movement and this is why in uh, pronouncing Cantonese Chinese, okay? Um, this is how we express, you know, two uh, energy going against each other like that in circles. And uh, sometimes we use it to mean a rope actually, you know, uh, of leather. And then of course, it also means to encircle, to go around. And then I was show you, uh, this is a Sumerian early pictograph, I mean early cuneiform, you can see that it's clearly a, a horn head 
uh, exactly like the Chinese way too. So for them, this is also the symbol uh, of spinning, okay? So you can see that somehow these people far away from each other in time and space, they all understand that unseen energy as a bull head, okay? And this itself, you know, you see this uh, rolling movement uh, with two horn head. It's also uh, used to mean the rope itself. So you will see that either the concept of the final product, we were very, very similar similar. So as you can see, um, f uh, as I explained uh, uh, about the letter A before, this finally, this bull form become the letter A. It's always showing an unseen energy of action. So this action of revolving or, or whirling or the rev movement, like an engine, is moving around. It's always, you know, concerned these three letters in writing itself, you know, either the V sound or the W sound or the R sound. In this, this is actually just a simple sound shifting the word become the verb and the word become the ra okay so of course you know the r itself as you if you have seen the last episode you will see that it's closely connected to the head is as well okay in a true sense okay i'll go on to the next one the whirling action and you will know that in English, these uh, words are still, you know, uh, heading by the W uh, alphabet, W sound. So this, in a way, either uh, audially or visually, is already indicating to you that they are something to do with the cyclical movement, okay? Of course, weaving itself is definitely cyclical, okay? And then I'll bring in the writing again. This is uh, Egyptian hieroglyph. This is uh, ancient uh, Sumerian. Uh, this is Chinese. You can see the sound, you know, is corresponding between Chinese and the hieroglyph. And then the, for the Chinese, you know, in the dictionary, we have record of this. This is actually what we call Y. This is a soft leather belt or rope, okay? And then, um, of course, if you look at this, you know, as an alphabet, this is an early uh, Phoenician alphabet R. It's the horn head, you know, as I show it to you, is closely related to the ram head the curving horn itself so um but then i uh I'm sure you understand this if you're a Christian. This is the symbol of Jesus Christ, right? And then if you say it, it will be the hero sign, okay? So exactly this is the X, which is the he letter. This is the R letter in Greek, okay? So you will see that the symbol itself is not invented by itself. This is this definitely has a long tradition, long, long time ago, as this uh, cyclical moving movement right here. And the explained to you by the Christian fathers will be, you know, the symbol is made up of the first two alphabet, you know, of the word crystal. Of course, you know, the first two words of the crystal is the is the he sound and the and the ao sound, okay? This is Christ. And for the people who believed in Jesus Christ, the Christ itself is a title. The Christ itself it actually means, you know, someone who linked to the to the to the to the thread, you know, and also either is the head himself okay he's the head he is also the end of the tail so it also um, you know draws a full picture when you go to that uh, time you know you have to go to back to that time to understand the full picture I'm not going into this religious need now because I have to go on with the following slides to explain to you how human achieve our understanding through the using of our different senses and now you will see how these things, you know, the concept will be shared. I will show you more of the writing. This is Egyptian hieroglyph. This is the uh, meaning of rope. Either you write it this way or either you write it this way. And then they also uh, mean a circular motion. You can see that they keep using this horn head to mean it, okay? So I will divide it and, and show you on the other side. These are the Chinese writing. Why? Again, this means the rope and, and you can look at the writing. Even the ancient writing has part that corresponding to the ancient Sumerian in a way. Of course, for us, either it means a leather rope, it also means, you know, to surround, to encircle. So the word itself, you know, the writing itself actually echoes that concept. And then, um, this is a ancient Sumerian sign, as I said, the sound carry is actually new. But if I follow the sound, I actually found exactly the same sound in Chinese. If I pronounce it in Chinese, 
Chinese Cantonese, you know, it will be now. Now actually means your hand using the hand to turn something. Of course, we have different, you know, writing, you know, uh, for using in different subtle situation, and of um, but. Basically, it all means to turn and the twist, okay? You will see the nu and the now. And if you go to the Phoenician or ancient uh, proto, I mean, um, and proto uh, Hebrew and the ancient Hebrew, you will see the the the, the N, uh, I should say Phoenician, sorry. Phoenician, you will see the N will be written like this. This is actually, a, or again, a twisting form. Exactly means the same. Everything is twisting. Either you make a rope, is a thread is twisting, either you you, the verb to twist or the alphabet itself is also a twisting form okay so if I follow this the alphabet itself become a visual uh, determinative you know for the Greek uh, Nima. Nima also means the thread. You will see that they actually transform this visual sign to, to tell you this is a twisting thread, okay? But if I follow the song, interestingly, Nim in Cantonese actually means twisting thread with fingers, which I see it again and again when I live with the people who still do this um, uh, twisting thread day in and day out. They all, they all twist their thread with these fingers. So the Chinese dictionary explanation goes side by side with the sound, goes side by side with the Greek meaning, okay? And if I go to that, you know, because in Chinese, if we also change the sound, we have lao also with that L. Lao also, again, means turn and twisting. But you look at, if I also follow the Western side of the alphabet, this is, again, a similar writing. This is actually an L in here. Hebrew. So only we draw the line which one is a Phoenician, which one is a Hebrew, but then in real sense as a human being, they all understand it similarly in a very, very similar and subtle way. Okay, so I'll go on to the next one. This is I show you the process of weaving. I see it again and again. It actually went through a, goes through a lot of different process. It will be thrown into this uh, threads like this, and then it will be spin into I mean turn into a, a, a you know a, a skirt like this, or, or or you can actually call it a hang, and that's follow the H sound. And sometimes for easy storage, they will twist it around like this. Then they will extend it out again and turn it into a ball. So I never get to understand why you have to go through so many different steps and um, but then when I read the ancient myths you know so you will always remember that Ariane Ariadne okay the ancient Greek myth, uh, myths you know they said that Jesus was given a ball of thread you know to go into the labyrinth with to kill the minotaur and but then uh, in the English book they will always tell you a ball of thread so I look into uh, it and then I wanted to find and now whether it was really a ball because I saw so many forms of thread in my traveling. So um, this is the story goes, you know, they need to take a ball like this. And when I look uh, into the internet, I found these images. They uh, This are all the 18th century uh, pictures. They will imagine because the book says they're bored of uh, thread. So the artist will follow those traditions to, to draw all these balls of thread. Um, but there is something wrong with it. If you are really this hero, will you be holding a ball in your hand when you are really facing great danger? Does it make any sense to you? So uh, I am a uh, person who always question okay so but if you only read them from both you follow books blindly then uh, and and the artists actually don't do real research they just follow the books too this is the problem with our modern education we believe in books too much we don't look at real life okay and this is really a cute picture I find okay so um, this is a little bit true to the reality you know this is a, a, a bobbin of thread that uh, that uh, thesis is holding looking for the minotaur itself so can but still can this be true do you think someone in great danger holding a, a sword facing a possible danger will really waste one hand to hold a thread so I look more into ancient images okay so that's what I found so uh, how do you think the threads were really carried this is what the pictures were. 
So this, I go into the, the, the a few hundred years BC uh, uh, utensil images, you know, of how the threads uh, were carried. Of course, you know, they would be carried like this with a, like a hang form, and then they will be going around like this. So I found different tradition within the Greek uh, thing, uh, really uh, Greek uh, area, they were still carrying like this across the shoulder. And I also want to, to take this chance to show you that, you know, the ancient draw pictures, not for decorative purpose, it's always to tell you a message. So this bird here is not for, um, uh, for for beauty. Uh, this is actually showing you the soul of the, the Minotaur because it's dead. This is an indication some something is dead, okay? So all the pictures, everything is an information. So you can really take it seriously as a book, okay? So you will see that this tradition here, you can still see the thread right here. You will see the thread right here. If uh, because at those times people understand things. People understand things better than us now, so they no one will really believe that they will carry a ball in their hand, okay? So you will see that, you know, no matter, you know, different areas in Greek, they still depict it like this because people are very close to weaving, so they understand what is needed, okay? So even uh, after a few hundred years in the in the very classic Greek period, when they all already achieved this beautiful portion of, of painting, you know, you see how well they paint at that time after a few hundred years of development, you will see that the thread is still very, very importantly carried across the shoulder. They were never like a ball. It's only now that we lost track of history that we believe that it was a ball, okay? So you will see that, you know, so this is the difference. But then I asked myself, why the ball was necessary in weaving, okay? So maybe it never occurred to you. And But then I actually found out that this is the first uh, artificial round object in human history. Uh, and, and this is the real round object that human really invented. And the alphabet invent, uh, uh, involved will be this W or the round, and then from, from this it will also be evolved to V, F, B, and, 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 and P, okay? But I'm not going to draw on this this time. I have other things to show you. And, and then this is a Greek sphere. You know, a ball is a sphere. A ball come from here, okay? A sphere. You will see that the Greek actually use a lot of visual cue. You, can you see that these things are actually always rolling? They are telling you that this is something of a potential of motion. It's very important the ancient actually put everything visually. It's only that now we pay so much attention just in the how they represent sound. For the, the ancient, they read more information by the writing, okay? So why a sphere is needed? Uh, when you can, you seem to be okay, you know, with this hang, okay? So you will see that now if you are doing kneading, you know, so uh, a ball is actually a pain in the ass, right? They are rolling around all the time. You would always prefer them to be like this. That's why the manufacturer never make them into a ball. They always make it like this because they don't want it to roll around unnecessarily. And then I will show you, you know, back this, you know, it actually, this is Egypt, I mean, this is Sumerian, this is Egyptian hieroglyph, this is Chinese, this is uh, Hungarian, this is this is uh, Proto-Hebrew, uh, uh, I mean Ancient Hebrew, this is uh, the Hank. So this is the development of all the H sound, all corresponding to a very vertical X movement around an axle. But why do we need a ball which goes around and horizontally with an axle horizontally? You will see that the Greek has a different writing of the S. Why the sphere is so important? Because it tells you a very cyclical movement moving in a different way other than the vertical axle movement. So uh, if you understand it slowly, go back to the YouTube type in. You need to think about this the, the the movement the exo movement and the cyclical movement they are they all move in a different play plane okay so the sphere all this is showing you different uh, circular motion why is the sphere necessary and why am, am i saying that uh, this rolling motion and why am i saying that the ball is the first human invention of a round object uh, look at this. Look at the following. This is the history of the ball game that you can find. Look at all this writing. I sat with these people and this is how weaving was done.
if you start to, to weave, you really want something that can roll itself to the other person where you can set up the, the, the what thread, okay? And this is more interesting. Notice, when our weaving becomes longer, rolling becomes too slow. The ball needs to travel in the air. So, and notice that the guy actually changing color of the threads too. So it's not just purely a game. It's a very mentally challenging thing. You have to be fast. You have to know what's going on. You have to know the pattern. And the ball is travel much faster than rolling. So both the rolling and the throwing of the ball in a cyclical movement is all built into our language. Look, this is the third time he changed color. From red to white to brown. Okay. So, thank you so much for watching. Uh, please go back to YouTube, type in the program name and you can understand it better. What I mean by turning in this uh, uh, vertical axle and what I mean by turning in, uh, in, in a horizontal way. So there's a lot of different spinning movement. Uh, the ancients seem to understand it much better than us. I hope you can follow what I'm saying. Thank you very much for watching.